talked about a character last week in the Old Testament. What was his name? Gideon. Thank you, Lena. <laughs> what was his name? Gideon. 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 And we've seen that Gideon is a judge. <coughs> we see that he's called to leadership. And we see, just like many of us, he has uh, uh, some, some issues with progressing forward in obedience to what God is calling him to do. And that's a battle every single one of us have. You know, the Holy Spirit is constantly, as he directs our life, he's constantly trying to woo you to do something that you've probably never done before. That's why it, it would require faith. <laughs> That's why it would require obedience. But our problem is all of us, we just like to be comfortable. Yeah, if it doesn't bother me, then, you know, whatever. Just don't stir me up. Well, the Holy Ghost, that's what he does. He tries to stir you, get you out of the nest because he wants you to fly. You know, he's constantly bringing the call of God upon your life because he wants you to do great exploits. Yeah. He wants you to impact someone else's life. There's someone out there. Maybe it's just one person that God is trying to reach that he can only reach them through you. Amen. So Amen. you may be wanting you to share a testimony Tell someone about him, you know, maybe lay hands upon the sick, you know, whatever it is, the enemy is going to fight you to keep from doing what the will of God is. Right. It's the will of God to save, to heal, to set free. That's God's purpose for all of us. And sometimes we just got to fight for what is right. Stand up for what is right. I wish I could stand and declare good news for Tuesday, but you know, wh whatever it is, whatever the outcome, God is still God. And God wants us to draw close to him and God's got a purpose for his church. And God wants to pour out through his church. So he wants to position us into a place where we're just going to believe him and we're going to trust him. Because, you know, like Gideon, a lot of times when God is, is speaking to us, which how many of you know God is speaking to you? And, and, and we, we second guess or we wonder, I, I, Lord, is this you? Is this? And then we ask God to show us some kind of sign to, to reveal what it is. Well, Jesus spoke in Matthew 16 and 4, and he called it a wicked and adulterous generation that seeketh a, a sign. Why would Jesus say that? Well, Jesus would say that because we're not living by what we see. We're called to walk by faith and faith in God's word. There's not a one of us that when we got saved, were we there at the cross. We weren't there when they buried Jesus. We weren't there when Jesus ascended back. We weren't there when he sent the Holy Spirit. But we believe the word of truth. And the word of truth comes when you believe it, it brings power to your life. That's what Holy Spirit does. He bears witness and with truth. Sometimes you, you feel it. You just know that you know because the Holy Spirit's revealing it to you. And yeah. It's pretty much what happened with Gideon in this story we're going to look at today. But we're not sign seekers, but there's nothing wrong with signs because when signs take place, we're not seeking signs, we're seeking the Lord. But the importance of signs and wonders is so God can reach his people, the Jewish people. Because the scripture says it's the Jew that required the sign. So he's trying to reach them. So as God is pouring out, 
It's the, it's the outside looking in. It's, the, it's the, the messianic Jews that are going to come to know Jesus. They need that sign. You know, he said, the sign that I give is the sign of the prophet Jonah. Yeah, yeah. And he left them and departed. And, and it's uh, if we're just seeking signs and not walking by faith in the Lord, he's saying that it's like being in the whale's belly. It's a it's a miserable life. It's a it's a life. That's a picture of, of hell uh, that, that, that Jonah in that whale's belly for three days and three nights. So, you know, it's just God wants us to put our faith in him. And when we put our faith in him, that's when we trust. And trust is the most foundational thing in any kind of relationship. If you're married, your relationship with your kids, all, all of you are here this morning to hear from God and to be led into God's presence. But by you being here and saying, Pastor, I trust you. I trust you as my pastor. Every relationship, trust is a must. It's foundational. And in our relationship with God the Father through His Son Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have to learn that there are times to take our hands off and say, let go and let God. God, I know that you're a God who works all things to the good of those who love you, who are called according to thy purpose, and God, I'm looking to you. Well, Gideon was no different. God has called him, and Gideon is in the midst of being a judge, who the judges were, were now leaders before the kings over Israel, and Gideon is in a in a place where, you know, he's looking with his natural eye and he's seeing these Amalekites, he's seeing these Midianites and they're great and they're many and, you know, it, they're, they're, they're powerful. It's like, oh boy, we, we don't stand a chance in the natural. And, you know, if David, if David would have done that, he would have never defeated Goliath. That's right. When, when, when the champion Goliath came out for 40 days and challenged Israel, they looked at his stature. They seen this hulk of a man 10 foot high that was threatening to them, that wanted to challenge them. And everyone that seen immediately feared, I'm not going to fight that guy. That guy is going to kill me. And, and David didn't go by what he was seeing. He went by what God has said. And he said, who is this guy? He's an uncircumcised Philistine. He don't have a covenant like the covenant that we have. Amen. And he said, today I'm going to take off this guy's head. I'm going to defeat him. And he spoke his victory and he stood before Goliath without fear and took down that champion Goliath of the Philistines. And so Gideon... He's looking at what he sees, and we learned last week that God was trying to call him first to his household, to his environment, to his city. And he was saying, I want you to take care of uh, first the household of faith first. And, and that's pretty much like a leader, a pastor. The scripture says, how can a pastor take care of the the flock or the congregation if he don't have his own house in order. Mm -hmm. And so God assigns him first. He says, I first want you to take care of this idol worship. And we had a picture last week of, uh, of, of Baal or, you know, or some call him Baal or, you know, he's the, he's a spirit of Molech. It's, a, it, it's passing your children through the fire. It's child sacrifice. It's, and that has never changed. And it's, you see that symbolism, you know, when you turn it on, it's hidden in cartoons and hidden in movies. And, and you know, that spirit still is today. And, and God is calling Gideon to take care of that idol that had been set up. And it was his own father who was a priest. His name was Joash who had was responsible for setting this all up. And so Gideon has an encounter. 
And remember, he was afraid. He was threshing weed, and he was he was in a hole and not out on a hill where the wind would blow the chaff away. And he was hiding because he was afraid. He battled fear. He had enough faith to take each step, but each step he needed confirmation from God. He needed a sign from God. And so and an angel comes to Gideon while he's at the wine press threshing wheat, and the angel says to him, Oh, you mighty men of valor. And I'm sure Gideon was thrown by that because he's probably thinking, I'm not a man of war. I've never trained in the military. I'm just a farmer, and you're calling me something that I'm not. You're calling me the destiny that's upon my life. You're calling me to rise up in leadership. Amen. You're calling me to lead Israel. You're calling me to be a military leader. And he says to the angel, if I'm a, a mighty man, a valor, then I need you to show me a sign. As if the angel, standing face to face, having a conversation, wasn't enough for Gideon. I, I, I sometimes like, wow, look at this. But, you know, when it's a life-threatening situation, remember fear, the backbone of every fear is death. It's torture, it's pain, and eventually it's death. That's what the enemy is always saying. So here's a, a, a life-threatening situation because the Midianites were powerful, and they would kill you, and there was way more than them. In the natural, Israel did not stand a chance. And sometimes we've got to get to that point to where we believe God above what's natural. Amen. Every circumstance and situation of your life, God wants you to believe him above what's natural. And we take what's natural and we just settle for it and say, okay, this is just how it is. And once we do that, it just, it, it cancels out faith. God wants you to continue to believe. He wants you to be a person of faith, walking by, living by, believing by. And when you put your faith in God, power comes into your life. Here is Gideon. And Gideon says to the angel, all right, if I'm a mighty man of valor, give me a sign. And he says, okay, go sacrifice a goat, some unleavened cakes, get some broth, put it upon this rock, pour the broth upon it. And once Gideon was obedient in that sacrifice, boom, the angel threshed out his staff, and it said the rock consumed fire, and the, the whole sacrifice just vanished right in the eyes of Gideon. And Gideon immediately worshiped the Lord. He built an altar. He called God Jehovah Shalom. He said, okay, now I got peace. And the angel gave him a confirmation that he needed. He said, you will not die. Okay, that built up enough confidence for Gideon to walk in faith, walk in obedience. And then... He begins second-guessing himself. We have those moments. Right. I'm doing this. I believe you, God. Oh, devil saying this. Oh, okay. Well, God, can you just give me another reassurance, God, of what you want me to do? Well, the assignment was to go tear down the altars of Baal. He went, he did it. And he knew that in doing it, it was probably going to cost him his life. And I wonder if there's anybody who would even dare to say, I would be obedient to that. I would do that. Because it's going to cost your life tearing down the altars of Baal. The next day they come to the house and his dad, you know, stands up for his son. I thought, you know, this boy, he never stood up for anything. I've never seen him bold like it. He's just a farmer boy, you know. And you know what? He said, if Baal's a god, then let him fight. Let him fight this battle. And he, he changed <coughs> Gideon's name. And, 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 and so Gideon passed the assignment. He tore down the altars of Baal and Asherah and, and, and the false gods. And, and then he's ready for the next assignment in this great fight. And it's like, ooh. 
and that's how it is. It's, you know, faith to faith, glory to glory. It's, you know, you have a moment in the Lord. It's a good moment. Get ready for the next moment. And God just wants you to believe him. And he, he wants you to do great exploits and keep believing him. Well, here's Gideon. He's passed the first assignment. He got needed the signs to do it. He got the signs. He was obedient. And, and now he's to fight these uh, Amalekites and these Midianites. And it's like, oh, Lord, there's way more than them. It's just like, if you want me to do this, this is God. This is what I'm asking of you. I'm going to take a wool fleece. And I'm going to put it out. And tomorrow morning when we get up, if that fleece is full of water and all around it, it's all dry, he said, that's the sign that I need. And the next morning he wakes up and he grabs that old fleece and he can wring it out. There was so much pool. <laughs> okay, God, he, he's been, all right, <laughs> I see, God, you want me to lead Israel. <laughs> he, he's taking some steps here, but, but like, oh, God, just <laughs> Don't get mad at me. <laughs> Don't get mad at me here. I, I just Let's do this one more time. <laughs> this time, God, instead of the fleece being wet, let it be dry and let the ground all around it, let it be wet. And just as he asked for, God gives him that sign. And, and immediately Gideon knows, okay, I, I'm ready for the next assignment. And here comes the assignment, Judges chapter 7 verses 1 through 3, and you're going to see that God is going to really test Gideon's faith. I mean, you know that your faith is tested. Oh, yeah. Amen. God is the manufacturer. Every manufacturer tests his, his product, and life brings those times where you're going to have to use the faith that God has given to you. The more you use it, it's just like a muscle. The more you use it, the more God's presence is going to be, the more and easier it's going to be to overcome. Those are the positions we don't normally like to be in because we just want to be comfortable. We want life just to flow. Everything's going good. And In fact, if you think about life, we, we have this natural way of saying more is better. I got more money. I got more possessions. I have more of this, and I'm happier than you. And that's a false misconception. The more of God that you have, the more content you're going to be with life, no matter what takes place. Yeah. Here's the case. Jerubabel is what his dad changed his name to, is Gideon. And all the people were with him. He gets up early, and he's ready for his assignment. He gathers everybody together, and then God speaks to him. And he said, if you're going to save Israel, I want you to cut down your very army. And I want you to take your army, and I want you to tell everybody who's afraid, I want you to go home. Yeah. Easy way out, huh? See ya. <clears throat> I'm not going to fight the Midianites. <laughs> They're going to tromp us in the ground. I'm going to die. I'm leaving. I'm going to save my own hide, and I'm leaving. God said, everybody who's afraid, I want them to go home. And what happens? Their return of the people, 22,000, and only 10,000 remain. So what's God done? He's taken more, which we think is better. He's cut the number down. Now, why is God doing this? He's doing this because he doesn't want flesh to take credit for right. what he's about to do. Amen. Because that's another temptation that man gets. Look what I've done. Look who I am. Look at the power that I've got. And God resists all that. You know, that's a prideful thing. And he don't want man taking credit for the victory that he has given. So he's cutting it down, and he's cut it down to 10,000. And Gideon got to be thinking, oh boy, God, we're really dependent upon you. And I'll tell you, as the heat gets turned up, we are in a vulnerable spot as the church where we're just going to have to just depend on God more. And that's what Abba Daddy wants. Just trust me. Just believe me and watch what I'm going to do. Glory to God. All right? So 
So he, here we are, this is Gideon, you know, wanting signs and being challenged in our faith. And we're down to 10,000. And God says in verse 5 and 6, uh, he brought the people onto the water. The Lord said, I'm not done yet. He said, I want you to bring all the people down to the creek, and I want you to observe these 10,000 that are left. And he said, every man that goes and gets a drink, and he drinks like a dog, he sticks his face in the water and laps up the water, he said, I want you to tell him to take a hike. He said, every man that comes and gathers the water and cups it in their hand and brings it up to them, he said, that's the one that I want you to keep. And Gideon observed, and guess what? The number goes from 10,000 down to 300. Wow. So Gideon got 300 men against maybe 200,000 or more people. 200,000 against 300. Not a chance in the world, in the natural. I mean, you know that all things are possible to those who believe. And all Gideon had to do was believe the report. Who's going to believe the report to whom the arm of the Lord is revealed? That's what Holy Spirit does. That's how you got saved. He revealed your condition sinfully and showed you your need for a Savior. Oh, and showed you the truth of where you're going to go without a Savior. Oh, I don't want to go to hell. So I better reach out and grab a hold of Jesus. And when you come give your heart to Jesus and he saves you, he saved you eternally. Yes. You are sealed of the Holy Ghost. You belong to him and he belongs to you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So here he's reduced the number down to 300. And then God is going to give him the assignment. So Gideon is in a spot where he has to trust God. Now look at this promise. This is, this is one of those top ten promises in the Word of God. This, this fits your marriage. This fits funerals. This fits graduation. This Every aspect of your life. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is powerful. Yeah. Trust. Trust in the Lord with everything you got. Don't think logically your own understanding. Trust the Lord. Hands off. God, I trust you. You gotta speak it. You gotta believe it. You gotta say, God, this battle ain't mine. You're gonna fight this battle for me. I trust you. You're gonna make a way. He said, in all your ways, acknowledge me. Jesus is a seek ye first the kingdom of God is righteousness. All these things will be added unto you, Matthew 6 and 33. If you do acknowledge him, he's going to give you the direction that you need. God, I'm trusting you. I'm acknowledging you first. I'm not going to act in my flesh or my own understanding. God, I'm trusting you. My trust isn't in chariots or horses. My trust isn't in man. My trust isn't in who's the president. Right. My trust is in the Lord. Yes. He said, do it with all your heart. So wherever, whatever walk of life you're in, on top, on the bottom, no matter what the battle is, God, I'm trusting you. And let me tell you, when you speak those words, God just immediately gets glory. That's what I want. <laughs> I'm your Abba Daddy. I'm going to help you. <laughs> you're my child. I love you. <laughs> I trust you. I trust you. I trust you, Lord. I'm not going to fear. I'm not going to worry. And God, I'm not going to look at the enemy. I'm not going to be intimidated by how big the enemy is, right. how difficult the enemy may be. No, I'm walking by faith. You know, Corinthians tells us to put our faith and trust in the things that are unseen. Because the things unseen are eternal. But he tells us those things that are seen, they're, they're, they're corruptible. And they will someday vanish away. My faith is completely in you. It's but by my God. I'll 
run through a troop. I'll leap over a wall. It's my trust in you. God wants you to believe him. No matter what place in your life, no matter how difficult it may seem to be, no matter what the world is saying, God, I trust you. You're a God of provision. You're a God that meets all of my needs according to thy riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I'm trusting you. God, I'm holding you to your truth, your word of truth. Your word will not fail. I am victorious, and I will overcome this battle that I'm going through. Glory to God. So here, back to Gideon. So here Gideon is. He's come to the same night, and the Lord said unto him, Go go get your men. And he said, no, I've delivered the enemy into your hand. But he said, I want you to go into the enemy's territory. I want you to go to the enemy's territory. I want you to go to the enemy's camp. And I've got a word there for you. And he said, but if you fear, you think God knew Gideon's heart? <laughs> I mean, you think I want to go to the enemy's camp? <laughs> Where there's so many of them? He said, I want you to take your servant. Now, I don't know how to pronounce this servant's name, but we're going to call him Pura, okay? <laughs> Pura, thy servant down to the house. Now, now I, I think about that person. I don't know. We don't know anything about Pura, except they're a servant. I mean, a, a servant is the greatest in the kingdom of God, okay? Yeah. The servant's willing to do what you want him to do, even if it means going to the enemy's camp. Even if it means let's go over there because... We could possibly die there. Take Pura with you and go to the enemy's camp. So apparently it was obvious that he feared because he took Pura. And he said, thou shalt hear that God is telling him, if you go to the enemy's camp, you're going to hear uh, what I'm about to do. And it's going to strengthen you for what you're about to do. And he went down with Pura, his servant, unto the outside of the armed Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east that lay along the valley were like grasshoppers. There was many of them, the multitude. There were so many camels that they couldn't even number how many camels there were. You know, this is like the sands of the seashore. This, so it's a, the enemy is large. And then they sneak down there. Here's Gideon and his servant Pura. And you can picture them. They're, they're, they're right by somebody's tent. They're listening to two guys speak. And the one guy's going to have a prophetic dream, and the other guy's going to interpret it. And when Gideon had come there, behold, a man had told a dream unto his friend. And he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into our camp. The whole camp was destroyed. All of our tents and everybody was dead. And... His friend answered and interpreted the dream, and he said, This is nothing else except for the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, and the men of Israel. For into his hand has God delivered Midian and all the host. So he's sitting there listening to this man's dream, telling his friend, and his friend is talking about Gideon, who's right outside the tent. He's hearing his own name. You talk about confirmation, and, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you personally, you know, when I ask God about certain things, there'll be certain things. Sometimes the battle is just having a word for Sunday morning, and it, it's just unbelievable how many times somebody that I'm around, it'll come right out of their mouth. God used that person, and that word come right out of their mouth, and it's like... Oh, God just used you. What you just said, I needed to. Oh, what I do? <laughs> it's okay. God just used you. I needed to hear what you just said. He confirms that like that. Well, Gideon's got that. And, and sometimes when you have a moment like that, when you have a presence of the Lord moment. Now, we all are different in our relationship with the Lord, but I, I, I'm talking personal. I can relate to Gideon's response here. Because it was so, when Gideon heard of this interpretation of the dream, that he worshipped. He worshipped. 
Now naturally, we'd be like, you know, I gotta get out of here before we get killed, you know? But he heard the word of truth that everything that God had been confirming to him come through the interpretation of this dream. And he had what I call a Holy Ghost moment. And it led him into that place where he just worshiped. He felt probably the love of God, the presence of God. You ever just have a, a moment like that where you just feel the Holy Ghost? Maybe you just begin to start weeping or, you know, it might shake you or, you know, it, I, I can relate to what Gideon is going on right here in just feeling God's presence. So, sometimes, this is just personal, I'm saying about me, but just personally, there are times and you know, I'll be in Walmart just standing in line and just, like, I just start feeling the love of God for somebody. And it'd be like, oh, no, I don't want to be all weird in here, you know. It's like, you know? And I'll just feel God's love for that person. And I'll just go over and, you know, put my hand on and just tell me God loves you so much. You know, maybe share the gospel with them. But I understand when it says Gideon worshiped right here. Because he heard the spirit of truth. Yeah. And the spirit of truth bears witness to truth. There are some things that we know as Christians that are discerned from the world. They can't understand it, and neither will they ever know it, because the spirit of truth lives in us, and it's a spirit of worship. That's why John 4.24 said, Those who worship me must worship me in spirit and truth. Gideon didn't care at all at this very moment after he heard that truth of whether the enemy was going to kill him or torture him or whatever. It was like one of those moments where it's you and God. And he worshiped God and then he goes back to the camp. And when he gets back to the camp, God gives him an instruction. And the instruction is to take those 300 men, put them in three sections of 100. And he said to give everyone in his hand, put a trumpet in their right hand, and then take their torch and, and make a clay vessel to put over the, the torch. And e each one had one of those. And Gideon told every one of them, I want you to watch me, verses 17 and 18. He said, look at me. And he said, I want you to do what I'm going to show you. And he took the shofar and he began to blow the shofar. And then he took the clay pots and, and he, he began to break them. And, 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 and when he took the clay pot off of the torch, there was light. So through this uh, way of military instruction, God is going to defeat the enemy by turning fear upon the enemy by noise and by light. And, and so Gideon tells the 300, three groups of 100, this is what I want you to do. So when you hear the shofar being blown, we blow the shofar every, every Sunday in both our services. It's just a reminder of victory. It, it's, a, it's a reminder of God's presence. And it's a reminder, too, that the enemy is defeated. Yes. And worship, it, it confuses the enemy. Right. And that's what this story does. So, so Gideon tells each one of them, position yourself. And here in verses 19 and 20, he came to the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch, and they had put newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets. So here they're blasting three, 300 men with a trumpet, blowing their trumpets, breaking those pitchers, making a loud noise, breaking them. This is, this is like 10 o'clock at night. And here the enemy is just settled for bed, and, and here they are. They're hearing all these trumpets go off. You imagine that's what the world's going to hear someday? They're going to hear the last trump, and, and they're going to look around, and we'll be gone. Glory to God. What a day that's going to be. And it could be sooner than later. And, and, and all of them got their lights, and they're coming down off of the, the hillside, and the and the enemy hears the cry of all these people, all this loud noise, 
And, and what does the enemy do? The enemy it turns on himself. And the 300 that blew their trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword of the enemy against each other. Here they are in the dark. What are they doing? They're, they're, they're killing everything that's beside them because of fear. And, and, and God causes a spirit of confusion. Yeah. And I pray that. I pray that the enemy's tactics for this upcoming election on Tuesday, that the enemy will be confounded and the enemy will be confused. He turned the sword against one another and they killed one another. God gave Gideon in Israel the victory because of their obedience, because of their surrender, because they believed the word of truth. And the word of truth was not a way of natural. It was believing and trusting in God. And, and maybe you're at that place right now that you're wondering, what does the next day hold? What is next week? How am I going to be provided for? How am I going to be taken care of? God said, oh, you can trust me. Yes. I'm your Jehovah Jireh. Uh, Philippians 4, 19, I provide every one of your needs according to thy riches in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you can just put your faith, your trust in me. And, and where does that come? That, that comes in that place of surrender. Not that we are weak, but it's not about our might. It's not about our power. It's not the victory through you. It's by my spirit, saith the Lord. God said, my grace is sufficient for you. He says, my strength is a maid powerful to you in your weakness. That is the place of surrender. Amen. And maybe God is just calling you to surrender this morning. As, as we sing a, a final invitation hymn, oh Lord, I need you. You can put your hands up and surrender to the Lord. You can come forward this morning. I'm going to ask Rich and Rhonda to, to come forward. And they'll pray with you this morning. But that place of surrender is the place where God infuses his power to you. Present yourself to God, and God will give you the power to overcome what you're going through. Let's give the Lord a hand clap.